Today I want to show you how they make a particle beam to do wonderful experiments. Now we've already shown you in our last video how they make targets for the beam to hit, but we haven't told you how they make the beam. And that's what we're going to see today. Brady and I have been at the GSI Institute in Darmstadt, where they have a magnificent accelerator, which has been operating for more than 60 years. It is beautifully engineered and for simple chemists like me, extremely complicated. But the start is pretty simple. The beam starts with a bit of metal that looks like that. This one is titanium, but they have a whole range of different metals and you'll see some of them as we go along. What happens is that at the start, you have to turn these metal chunks into ions. Those are positively charged atoms, say of titanium. So the metal has to be vaporized, not the whole lot at once, but just a small amount. And it is vaporized by plugging it in to an electrode that looks a bit like this. And it just goes into here and the ions come out of a slit on this side. As you probably know, that when you have moving positive ions, you can move them around with magnetic fields, with electric fields. So there's a whole series of plates to accelerate the ions, magnets and more plates to move them round corners, make them go faster and so on. So we use the uh, extraction system to pre-accelerate these um, ions and then they were banded right here with the huge banding magnets. They were separated uh, by charge state and then transported yeah. right here through these quattro poles and then um, post-accelerated. And here we apply up to 130 kilovolts um, um, accelerate the ions up to 2.2 keV per nucleon. And essentially, Brady and I saw one lot of magnets or plates after another, increasingly going, wow, 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 as we saw they got bigger. So that's if the source can come from metal. Sometimes the source, like today, for example, the source comes from an, um, a gas. You have a gas. Where does the gas have, come from? Yeah. Here we have little gas bottles. Okay. where we let in uh, the gas into the plasma chamber and um, we heat part of the source and electrons um, comes out of the surface and then hit these atoms and uh, produce ions. After it's gone through all of this, it is fed into the main accelerator, which we could only look through through a window because it was running when we were there. Though on a previous visit, you can see me going along in front of the accelerator when it was switched off. Our guide through all of this was Ralph Hollinger, who has been in charge of the team for a long time. But the, the source of the plasma chamber itself, it's only this small piece here. Seemed to know everything that they could possibly ask about these um, beams. We began seeing one source. That seems very small. How, how long will that last? How long can the beam run? Oh, with a, with a high duty factor of 50 hertz and 5 milliseconds, it's a one day. That's a day's Each, worth yeah, of beam? Day, yeah, every day we have to change the source and we have different, uh, many kinds of sources, 12. And we were then taken into a room which was full of different sorts of sources and different sorts of metals that were going to be ionized. This is a multi, multicast ion source. Yeah. Right. Uh, right, uh, rather um, um, a huge or large um, a plasma chamber. Um, you, you produce gaseous um, ions with this kind of source. The one that really took me was a sample of silver. For the silver 
source. And the silver itself is only a few millimeter here on the, on the surface. They don't use a whole lump of silver. Preplasma is created and a few millimeters from there is the anode on anode potential and the vacuum arc is burning from cathode to anode. So what I really liked was that they had a sample chamber, which they called a revolver, which could take a whole number of these samples and could switch automatically under the vacuum of the apparatus without having to take everything out and changing. This is pure silver metal, yeah. Do you ever put gold in the beam? <laughs> yeah. You do? Can you show us any gold? Brady, of course, wanted to see gold. Uh, let's have a look here. He was shown a gold sample. We do not use pure gold. We use uh, gold uh, chromium because we have to create a plasma with a charge state of four plus. And with pure gold, it's too, too, the melting point is too low. Uh, um, it's, it's not, will, will, will not work here. Yeah. It turns out it's difficult to use pure gold. So they use an alloy of gold and chromium, which has a much higher melting point. Because if they use pure gold, then the heat of the plasma that is vaporizing it melts the gold and it runs away. Of course, you need clever engineering because you generate electrons. And if you do nothing, the electrons will go the other way and will hit parts of your apparatus and could damage them. And when you make a beam, there is a trade-off. If you want to have a lot of ions, you can't have them very highly charged because things that are charged repel each other. And if they have very high charges, they repel each other more. So if you want a really highly charged ions, then you have to have a rather dilute beam. If they're only slightly ionized, one plus or two plus, you can have a much higher density. And very often you need different intensities. I think Ralph described it as brilliance rather than intensity. Um, then you have to vary the charge to suit what beam you want. What you can see here is a lot of diagnostic, beam diagnostic, quadrupoles to focus the beam, to transport the beam, uh, turbo pumps, water cooling, additional diagnostics, a bending magnet to separate the different um, uh, isotopes, for example, with slits. Once the ions have been created, accelerated to moderate speed, they're then injected into the main accelerator tube and they whiz off and by the end they're going at up to 90% of the speed of light. So there's the injector was in there, bends around the corner here, under me, and off to the accelerator and off to the experiments on the other side of that wall. The reason why everything looks so big is the fact you need very powerful magnets and very high voltages to accelerate the things and turn them and to create this high energy beam. So most of the things that Ralph showed us to begin with were bits or the outside of bits of kit, but we couldn't actually see anything moving or reacting. But then he took us to an area where they have a simple apparatus for testing plasmas, where the equipment has a transparent plastic tube, so you can actually see inside. And here you can see now um, the um, cathode, which you hold in your hand, yeah. is only one and not 70 and so on. But um, on cathode potential, then the trigger, the high voltage trigger arm, and then the anode on anode potential, then the drifting, and then comes the extraction here. We were taken inside and shown this apparatus, but 
when it was running, everybody had to go outside. The apparatus was shut in with a big door, a bit like a prison. <laughs> OK. And the thing that I really liked was because of the high voltages, you couldn't press the buttons on the kit inside. So they had long plastic rods, which they poked through the holes in the netting so they could adjust the equipment. And you could then see the pulse of the plasma, which was generating the atoms and then the ions. Although it was silver, it had a nice sort of bluish green color. To begin with, it was pulsing about once a second, but they turned some knobs outside and it started pulsing faster and faster. Now, the reason why they want to have pulses of ions is because of a unique feature of this particular accelerator, that it's really like a big model railway system. They have several sources, all pulsing away, but at different times. And magnets, so one pulse of one metal can be switched in after the pulse of another metal, like trains going along a railway line, one after another. And at the other end, they have pulse separators. The silver pulses can come to me, the gold pulses can go to Brady, and Krypton can go off to some other experiment. So they can run multiple experiments at the same time, which means that many people can use the equipment for different purposes all simultaneously, so you can get the long experimental runs that you need, for example, creating some of these super heavy elements. Finally, we were taken into a room where they stored the different metals. And Brady got quite excited again because there were boxes of the different elements. But no gold! The gold was in a safe and we weren't shown how to get into it. So, but both Brady and I were given samples of these electrodes that had been covered with gold that had evaporated onto them. The thing I found most amazing was that there was this vast accelerator, hundreds of meters long and this diameter. But to drive it, you just need a millimeter or two of titanium metal. So you need almost no material at all to run this thing for perhaps a week. To control all this switching is very complicated. And so they have a very big control room. Reminded me very much of a signal box for a railway system where they have pictures of where the various trains are. So we were taken to this huge room with computer screens all over the walls. Perhaps the most fascinating thing is that they have a piece of metal coated with a fluorescent coating, which they can drop into the beam and then visualize the cross section of the beam. And they stopped the beam for us because, of course, when this goes into the beam, it stops it so that Brady and I could see what the beam looked like. They use this beam imaging to make sure that the beam is the right shape, that it's got the right intensity profile and so on. So the beam is perfectly centered. So the center is this, uh, marked by these lines. So we are very happy with it. If you like, for tuning everything up to giving it super performance. And slowly draw it out. She draws it out without touching anything and it has to have a very smooth and no wrinkles. Lovely, that is a skill, that is. And then you cut round it with a scalpel 
and you've got your sample. 